Hello and welcome to Bible Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. We are so excited to have each and every one of you join in with us today. Um, Pastor Scott has an amazing message entitled Collateral Damage. We ask that you keep all your phones and other devices on mute just to avoid any background noises. If you are to be asked a question by Pastor Scott, please unmute yourself and then remute once answered. Lastly, Bible is a fully accredited charitable organization under United States Code 501c3. If you desire to send a monetary donation um, in order to help those less fortunate, please do so by going to our website at www.intlword.net. That will allow you to make your online donation. Without further ado, I will now turn it over for our opening prayer. Mr. Dion there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Will you please bow your hands with me? All right. uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another day, Lord. I ask that you just uh, bless this message, Lord, that you just anoint our pastor in this teaching, Lord, and um, pray that it just touches our ears and uh, it touches our hearts, Lord, and that we don't have this message, you know, to just go through our ears and, you know, not apply it to our lives, Lord. I pray that it's truly life-changing, and I pray that it uh, increases our faith in you and, uh, keeps our walk upright even that much more. But Father, I pray that you just bless this upcoming week, be with us through this upcoming week, and have us to keep on coming to this message to learn even that much more as well. Um, but Lord, we're just thankful and grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I have some praise reports. Okay, um, I have a uh, sister, Shyla. Um, she is being blessed on all sides. She wants to thank God for Minister Dion and his friendship. Um, she actually had a photo shoot. Um, and the day prior to the photo shoot, Dion just came into work, like no problem for her to do her hair for her. And she said that words cannot express how much she appreciates him and is so blessed to have You all are muted. And yeah, you guys are muted. Was I muted that entire time? No, just when you get ready to say your next testimony. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> like, oh no. All right, uh, Minister Emmanuel. Um, he is thankful for financial blessings. Uh, I will include myself in that one uh, as well. Um, he was blessed with a free haircut by the best barber in Green Bay, Minister Dion. <laughs> um, Emmanuel is also blessed with the opportunity to give clothes to those in need. I'm going to add myself in there too. We were blessed to, <laughs> to give to um, those in need. Um, and then Emmanuel as well, um, the music pastor from a church that he played at recently, um, he played drums at, had um, shared several letters um, and messages of appreciation from the congregation with Emmanuel, um, just thanking him for the anointing over his life reflected through his worship. So pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then Emmanuel has another one. <laughs> um, he... Um, just is blessed to have such a wonderful, kind-hearted, and loving, and most supportive family that made his Father's Day so special. So um, thank you so much for those praise reports. I love it. Um, and I will pass it on to Elder Angel Maris. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. We are so delighted today that you have joined us for Bible Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Today's pa Pastor Scott will deliver an anointed two-tiered message entitled Collateral Damage. Together, we will explore the reality of why negative events often befall those who associate with people who carry unresolved issues from their past. Through vivid illustrations, he will reveal how conflicts between others can lead to the downfall of innocent bystanders. This message will challenge you to reflect on the complexity of all your relationships and the unforeseen impacts they can have on our lives. Moreover, Pastor Scott will emphasize the importance of trusting God's word above our own thoughts and prejudices. This message will expose the need for believers to rely on divine wisdom rather than personal biases, 
You will also learn how to remain blessed amid turmoil and conflict grounded in biblical truth. So let's get ready to grow together in understanding and faith as we listen to God's word through our faithful leader, Pastor T. Archit Scott. Well, thank you, thank you, and thank you. I appreciate your kindness. And um, I appreciate each and every one of you all for what you do to add on to Bible. I always say Bible is not built around myself when we do know Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth, but it's all of us working together to fulfill God's purpose in our lives. I want to take the opportunity, first of all, also to thank uh, some of my friends. I see Sister Michaela and uh, Sister Laura Lai, Sister Shyla, Brother Memphis. I'm assuming that it's Brother Memphis. Uh, I see also Elder Brian Barrett, my dear friend the actual Finley family, the Scott family, the Barrett family, and a host of many, many others. So we want to get ready to get into the word of God because God does have a word for us all today. And it'll be vitally important that you pay attention because there are certain things that I'm sure you may not have heard before. Even though we may have heard this story in the Bible, there are certain things that we may not have heard. So I don't want anyone to get confused and not hear what the spirit of the Lord has to say to them. All right. So today the actual message is entitled collateral damage. It never ceased to amaze me um, how God tends to give me a title before I even know what the message is going to be about. He can do that because he knows the beginning from the end. And many times I'll be talking with uh, Minister Emmanuel, and I'll be saying, what, what do you think, you know, is a message for this week? And we'll just go through a litany of things. And so he let me call out about 10 titles. And when I got to this one, he said, that's the one. And I said, hmm, okay. And then the Lord said, that's the one. And you know what I was feeling all the time? That's the one. Collateral damage. And I know some of you may already know, but let's talk a little bit about what is collateral damage. Uh, let me have someone, if you raise your hand so I don't embarrass anyone, because that's never my intention. What do you think collateral damage is? Minister Emmanuel. Um, collateral damage is like some kind of form of like an accidental or injury or some kind of form of damage that was uh, done or caused um, to a person that it wasn't originally intended for. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Let me give you a definition, a few definitions of collateral damage so we can kind of see because uh, in our life right now, we're seeing a lot of collateral damage everywhere you look. And generally, this terminology, collateral damage, was used for at times of war. But we find out that people aren't only damaged in war, but even in life. So let me give you a definition. Collateral damage, I had it written here, that's why I'm looking on this board, uh, is unintended damage or injury or pain caused accidentally or unintentionally to those individuals, it can be one individual, but to those individuals that have been caught in the middle of a situation. Let me read it again. It is an unintended damage or in injury or pain caused accidentally or unintentionally to those or an individual caught in the middle of or of being traumatized. It can be in between a middle of a problem, a situation, or some trauma. Here's another definition. Collateral damage is an uh, incident uh, with a person that becomes a victim just by being in the vicinity of a problem. A victim uh, even being in the vicinity of a problem. And lastly, Collateral damage is damage that is caused to a third party, someone who has nothing to do with the conflict that was there, 
but because they were there, they were damaged also. I was talking to a person just yesterday, and I said to them, many times when people are being introduced to others, we are actually meeting their past for the first time. Elder Angel Bear, what do you think I mean when I say many times when we're introduced to a new person, we're meeting their past for, a first, for the first time? I believe that everyone um, who hasn't had any time on earth goes through all kinds of experiences. And before that, uh, the day that I meet them, they have uh, some negative things that have taken place in their lives that caused them to act the way that they do. So even mm -hmm. though I might not know why he or she behaves that way and why they act just, it seems a little off. I am meeting their past because of something they've been through causes them to behave that way. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing uh, that, that point. And thank you, Mr. Emmanuel, for sharing uh, your point also on collateral damage. It is that way. Many times, believe it or not, each and every one of us are holding on to certain things from our past. We are. Because when we were past, in our past, it was called the formative years, when we were just being developed and we were learning a character that was going to become us for the rest of our life. But because many of us, we actually observed certain people that were significant in our life. And what we did, we put it in like a bag. Let's just say if this was a bag. And we saw like, for instance, my life, I was very influenced by my father. So I like, ooh, I like his personality. So I put that in my little bag. Oh, I like the way how he deals with conflicts. I put it in my bag. Oh, okay, I like the way this person, my mom, how she handles certain things that I put in the bag. And this people that were influential in my life, I put all these things in my bag and it was called my bag of life. And that is what I used and lived by as time would go on in my life. I would just say, you know what? I remember how my dad would handle this. And I just, have you ever heard of people saying, oh, they coming out of a bag? Yeah, it's the bag of life. And we actually, we go in there, we reference that a lot of times. But there are times when we have to face certain things that we've never faced before. And we can't go into that bag because it's not there. We don't know how we're going to handle certain things. And just, just let me just got to be real, come down everyone's street. Sometimes we deal with conflicts that other people have not had to deal with. And when we deal with those conflicts, they are something that we cannot run away from. Sometimes in life, there are certain things we have to face and have to face it head on and say, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to make the right decision or the wrong decision, but I got to come up with something. And what we tend to do is we come out of a bag where we don't even know what we're going to do. And that's what we'll perform. Many times, when things like that happen, especially unexpected things, when we come out of this bag, it's things that have not been thought out. Have you ever found yourself in a predicament and it was something you had to make a quick decision on and you didn't think it out? And then next thing you know, you made a real bad decision and now you're having to, you, it, it, not necessarily right now, but you had to suffer from that mistake. Minister Dion, have you ever had a time like that? You make a decision of something you should have thought out even more. And instead of thinking it out, you you want to handle this thing yourself. And then you made a bad decision. What was that like for you? Um. Yes, sir. And I guess it just felt like, I, I don't know. You remember the conversation. I just kept calling myself stupid. So, yeah, I just felt, uh, I felt very, um, I felt powerless. I'll say that for sure. Yeah. You know what? Sometimes ill-advised decisions, um, when we think back on it, we say, I wish I never did that. I wish I wasn't like that. And then here's another part about this uh, collateral damage. Sometimes we pick up even bad traits from people and mostly more bad than good. A lot of times when we pick up bad traits from people, uh, we do that as a self-defense mechanism so people won't bother us. And when we don't want people to bother us, 
we have to show some type of way of I'm not going to let anybody bother me or get in my face. Sister Tanya, how did you used to deal with conflicts in life when it came down to people and you didn't want them to be around you or bother you? How did you deal with it? Uh, it would depend on the situation. Um, it was either verbal. I would say what I wanted to say to them, how I felt about them to their face. Um, or sometimes it was just removing myself completely and I would just block them from my entire life. <laughs> Jeez. Lock them from their, your entire <laughs> life. Yeah. That is called con conflicting. Woo. You know, again, many people are like that. Then you have certain people that seemingly would be calm, cool, collective, but sometimes the calm, cool, collective, they hold things inside. I have known uh, Elder Brian Barrett over 35 years. I have never seen him mad. I'm talking about mad, angry, to hollering, and yang, 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 yang. Never. How do you stay so calm? And, and what do you do when you're angry, uh, Elder Brian Barrett? Uh, how do I stay so calm? Uh, it's probably medication. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, uh, I just uh, a lot of experience working with people and, and getting to know people and trying to understand that some of them intentionally trying to get under your skin. And there's just a place where I just don't allow people to go. Absolutely. And you got to defend yourself. But it all depends on how we defend ourselves. Collateral damage can also be called things like PTSD. And when you hear about PTSD, um, Elder Angel Bear, what's PTSD mean? The letters stand for post-traumatic stress disorder. Absolutely. You can be and have PTSD and don't even realize because you've been traumatized. And when I talk about people meeting your past for the first time, that's what I mean. A lot of times there are things that you dealt with in your past that were very traumatic, that have affected you. And believe it or not, we carry it around with us, even though there are times that we don't want it to be seen. So what we do is where there has been conflict from our past, we take that actual, those thoughts. And what we do is we put them way in the back of our mind and we take it and put it in this little this little uh, room and we take the key and lock it and we say, we don't want to deal with that anymore because it hurt me too bad. And we said, we're going to get rid of it. I'm throwing away the key. Here's what we don't realize a lot of times when we are actually putting these things in the back of our mind, that those things, even though they've been locked in that room, they still grow. And when unresolved conflicts from your past continue to grow, they will outgrow that room. And when they come out, they're coming out with a force. I know what I'm talking about. And even though people don't realize it seemingly, it's just lying there dormant. But if there's anyone that you come in contact with that reminds you of what you locked up in that room and why you locked it out, I mean, locked it up, it'll come out. Haven't you heard and haven't you seen people that seemingly all you did was, hey, how's it doing? I mean, how's it going? You doing all right? What do you mean by doing all right? Was there a reason why you don't think I'm doing all right? What's the problem with you? I mean, and it's like, wait a second. All I did was, I, I mean, well, okay, let me just say it like this. Hello. Yeah, I know hell is low. Yeah, well, you trying to say I'm going to hell now? Is that no matter what you say, no matter how you do it, and the conflict is not with the person who's being screamed at. The conflict's in that individual. Unresolved issues from the past. That's why I talked about this collateral damage, because of many times those people were hurt. You'd be surprised if you had parents that used to fuss and argue in front of you as a child, and you saw this happening day and night, and seeing what things were said and what things were done, you may have been affected by it, and it affected your actual personality also. That's why when people talk about getting in relationships, whether it's boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband and wife, when you're talking about getting into a relationship, 
you need to know this. And this is something that's noteworthy that you should write down. Learn to discover each other first before you get married. Learn to discover each other first before you get married. You can't discover anyone or anything unless you're seeking to find the truth. When I was uh, brought up, I, was ma I majored in journalism. And when I was majoring in journalism, they taught us uh, six things. When you talk with people and you're trying to find the truth, always ask who, what, when, where, why, and sometimes how. When you ask those questions, listen intently or intensely so that you can get a clear answer. And if we don't listen to what people are saying, we will not. We will respond to it the way we hear it, which is the way we think they're saying it. Many times you can be having conversations with each other or with other people, and you'll be saying something to them, and they will come back with an answer that's totally has nothing to do with what you're asking or talking about. And that's because it was in them and what you said resembled something that they had conflicts with in the past. So today in the Bible, I'm going to talk about a, a unique story that took place. And I want you to know it's going to ride along this actual um, thought about collateral damage. One of the actual definitions, if you'll remember, uh, had to deal with people who were third party. They didn't have anything to do with the conflict, but just because they were there, they got wounded also. So out of the book of 2 Kings, the actual sixth chapter, I'm going to read a verse, and then I'm going to go to 2 Kings, the seventh chapter, and read a few verses, and then we'll discuss it. So again, we're in 2 Kings, the sixth chapter, verse number 24. I'll be reading for you hearing out of the book of the King James Version. And the Bible says this as follows. And it came to pass after this that Benadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. I'm going to the seventh chapter now. I'll begin reading from verse number one through four. The Bible says, Then Elias, I mean Elisha, said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned, uh, leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until ye die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we shall die also. So now, therefore, come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Okay, let me explain what's going on at this time. As I read in the actual sixth chapter of Second Kings, there's a unique situation that's taken place. There is a war going on between the Syrians and the children of Israel. The children of Israel are in a place which is actually in Israel, one of the regions, the largest region in Israel, which is actually where their headquarters is, and it's called Samaria. In Samaria is where the king of Israel is, is residing. Now, at this time, Israel is divided into two parts. As you do know, Israel has 12 tribes of Israel. Ten of them are located in the north, and two of them are located in the south. So the actual ten that are located in the north, the actual Syrians, the king, Benadad, 
order that they would be sieged. What it means to be sieged, in other words, to have a siege on a people, is to surround the entire city in so much that no one can go out and no one can come in. This is a strategy that even they use in today's society when it comes to war. For those of you who may not have known, when I was in the military, my actual position was a historian. So I studied and wrote books on the history of the Air Force. One of the things that I would write on is when they would do a siege. If you have been keeping up with the news even today, the uh, we find out that uh, Israelis have done a siege on certain places that are out in Gaza so that people can't go out or come in. And what it does is it causes the people to suffer. Sister Shay, how do you think, what's one way that the people are suffering by not being able to go out or into their city to get anything? What way could you see that that would help, that would cause them to suffer? Um, they would starve or they could starve to death because there's, they can't get food. Absolutely. Imagine if people put a siege on your home where you and Minister Dion live and you can't go out and you can't come in. And they turn off and control your water. So when you're talking about now, you can't eat. You can't even get anything to drink. You can't go to any stores because the supply is very much a high in demand. And let me ask this question then. Uh, uh, Minister, I mean, yeah, Minister Dion, when things become scarce, Items to buy for food become scarce. What happens to the price of them? Oh, it goes up. It's inflation. It goes up. High inflation. Extremely. I go to the store at the, and nowadays, and I, I used to look at the prices on the food, and I'm, I am a professional food shopper because I'm a chef also, but I buy foods all the time. So I know you tell me the store, and I know when they have their sales, What's the best things to buy? What things can substitute for other foods? And what things are not good at all? But when I go to the store now, and I go to a place and I see the actual prices have skyrocketed three and four times the amount it was just in five or five or six months ago. Oh, believe me, I know it is inflation, but also I know that it must be a product that they are saying now is hard to get or how to hard to get delivered. Also, along with that, let me just leave it on today right now. Also, in today's society, it's not always that it's that high, but there are people that are called price gougers. They are deliberately leaving the price of food very high so they can make up during the time of COVID the money that they lost and they could care less if people can't afford it. Well, let me say this. During this time when this siege was put over on the children of Israel that were in uh, Samaria, the actual people were eating dong, you know what dong is, from pigeons. They were selling it from doves. They were selling dove dong. That's poop for y'all if you don't know. Can you imagine someone say to you today, listen, we're out of everything in the store, but we do have some dove poop to sell. And the price of the dove poop was just amount, just as much as the price of a steak. They didn't have any steaks. All they had was these things. Not only that, but for meat, they were eating donkey heads. Donkey head. Have you ever seen that in a supermarket? Not in the United States. You had, have you ever had donkey head? No. That's what it, and they were selling it for 80 shekels. The poop was for five shekels. You'd almost have to be rich. And that's one of the things that uh, sieges do. They attack people who are generally, uh, they're not wealthy. They're very poor. And people that are poor are generally going to be the first ones to suffer. Watch this. Last thing that they were eating were their children. Uh, I can't fathom 
doing something like that. But I'm going to say like this. When people are desperate, they are capable of doing anything. One story in the Bible in the same chapter, chapter number six, talked about a woman who came to the actual king of Syria, I mean Samaria, which is the, uh, the king over the children of Israel. And she said, I got a problem and I need you to resolve it. And he said, what is this problem that you have? Because he was out for a walk. He wasn't thinking somebody was coming to him with a problem. She said, yes, I have a problem. A friend of mine who has child, we both had children around the same time. She decided, or we decided that we were going to eat our children, mine first. And we actually killed and cooked my child. This is in the Bible. Killed and cooked my child and ate it. When we had dissolved the entire child, it was time for her to give her child up. And her child, she went and took him and ran away and hid. When the king heard about that, he rent his clothes and said, how can I resolve this? Am I a god? I can't resolve this problem. We are under siege. We have this enemy, these Syrians that have surrounded us and we can't get to any food or anything. So I can't help you. And in his rage, he then wanted to blame Elijah. So he called for Elisha. Now you should know Elisha was a servant of the prophet Elijah. So Elisha knows that the king is upset, but he doesn't know to what extent. So he goes to see the king, and when he goes before the king, the king is sitting in session with his other leaders, and he says, where is this God of yours? And Elisha is like, what are you talking about? He's saying the people are starving, and you say that your God is God, and you want us to serve him, but we don't see him. And then Elijah looks over at the king, and he says this to him, as I read earlier. By this time tomorrow, we're going to be totally out of power. And everything that had a worth of a lot of price there, all those prices are going to come down. And God is going to move in such a way that it's going to be sold. Even the regular foods that we used to eat, it's going to be brought back to us. And we're going to be able to have everything fine. There's a man who's standing right next to the king, who's one of his actual leaders of the kingdom, and he was leaning on the king when he heard Elijah say this. Have you ever looked at people when they just think, you just lying, ain't no way in the world. These things are not going to work out. I don't care who you think you are or what you think you know. I have figured this out, and there's no way. This man says to Elijah, if God himself would open up the windows of heaven, he still would not be able to work this situation out not by tomorrow, Elisha looks at this man and says, not only will our God work this situation out by tomorrow, but you won't even be able to see it happen. This man doesn't understand what Elijah means. The Bible then panders over to a situation dealing with four leprous men. Let me just let you know this. Leprosy is a skin disorder that eats away on the bacteria. It causes bacteria to eat away on the flesh of the actual skin. And what happens is gank green, which is a which is a disease that actually pours into your, your, your flesh, causes your body parts to be eaten up and dry up and thaw off. So uh, leprosy was considered one of the most horrible diseases out in that time. And so by the law, no one having leprosy could be inside the city. They had to live outside the city. Now remember this, the same city that these four lepers were kicked out of is now surrounded by the Syrians. So you got the Syrians surrounding the actual whole, the entire city. You got these four lepers that are at this gate the front of the gate for the city and can't get in because they have leprosy. And then you get the people that are inside the city and they're being starved out. These four people, the Bible said, these four lepers 
They were having a discussion with each other. And let me just say this. It is important that when you're going through any situation and you have others going through the same thing, talk about it. Just bring it out. It could be you having a relationship with somebody. Bring it up. Talk about it. See if you can't come up with solutions. But next, you got to pray and ask God for direction. You got to pray and ask God for direction. And I would suggest you pray and ask God for direction, first of all. Because if things weren't already that bad, look at this. How do you think it, first of all, feels to have leprosy? And this didn't come upon you. It wasn't just, it was you, you deliberate. No one deliberately gets leprosy. But it happens. It's contagious. How do you think these people are feeling, uh, Elder Angel Barrett, having leprosy? And they have it, and they can't even be around their loved ones, their friends, their family. It's just four of them, and they can't be around anybody else. How do you think they're feeling? They're emotionally devastated. Um, it's, it, it's like it's on the top of their mind all the time, um, wondering, is this going to be this way the rest of my life? They're just devastated, and they feel isolated and very alone, very misunderstood. Absolutely. Sister Shade. Thank you for sharing. So, Shade, how do you think it would feel to have this leprosy? And like I see some of your relatives even on the screen right now, and you could never see. Now, this is before they had, you know, they didn't have cell phones, <laughs> iPhone, uh, all these other type of uh, mechanisms. So you could not even come in their vicinity, and you were pronounced as unclean, and no one could have any association for, with you, and you couldn't even live in the city, nor could you touch anything that anyone else would touch. How do you think that would feel? Um, very depressing, lonely. Um, it could definitely cause like even deeper thoughts of, you know, why am I even here? Is my life even worth it at this point? Um, because I feel like we are we're social people. We need to be around people to feel Mm -hmm. connected. So I feel like that would be really, really difficult. Absolutely. Absolutely. You'd almost wonder, you know, is this, is this what life is about? Why was I dealt this hand, as people have said? Why did this situation happen to me? Sister Tanya, how do you think you would relate? How would, how would you see your relationship with God, knowing that you have this uncurable disease of leprosy, and you've been kicked out of the city, and you can't even get food, nor can you get drink. <laughs> yeah, it would be hard to have a relationship with God because you feel like, like, what did I do? What did I do to deserve this? And um, yeah, I think it would be really difficult. You know, how are you supposed to tell anybody else how God is so good when you're going through what you're going through? You know, so even witnessing would be extremely hard. So all around, yeah, it would be it would be super difficult. Absolutely. Listen, I want you all to know this, and this is for a fact. The very thing that you're going through right now is really not about you. It's really not. And I know when I say that, it's easy for people to huh, it ain't about me, but why do I have it? Listen, if you'll give God enough time, you'll see that everything is in his timing. And the very thing you are going through right now is for the deliverance of others. Well, wait, whoa, whoa. I, I say that again. I'll say it again then. The very situation that you're going through, because every single one of us are going through something. We all have something. It may not be leprosy. It may not be in your physical body. It could be something you're going through psychologically. It could be something you're going through spiritually. It could be something that you're going through financially. But everybody got something every single one of us. And most of the times, what we do is we live with silent frustrations. We just live with it because we've had it so long and we don't tell anybody and we just deal with it time and time again. I know uh, people that I know uh, uh, been married for a long, long time. And this is not one family. This is several families. And they have gotten to a point where they said to themselves, you know what? I'm too old to get divorced. So I just, they just become friends. And don't you know, 
you can go from marriage to just becoming live-in partners or friends just because you have disputes from your past that you don't want to have resolved because you say you tried to have it resolved and they'll never change. Haven't you heard yourself say this about people? They'll never change. They're always going to be like this. And so because you see them like that, you don't put anything more into them because in your mind, they can't change. Let me say this, sir, madam. Did God not change you? It may not have been one day. It may not have been one year. But God changed all of us who have called on the name of the Lord. And before we give up on people, remember that God is still saying the same power of God that changed your life and came in your life can come in their life. Watch this. So here they are, these four lepers. They have been kicked out of the city and pronounced as unclean so that every single person knows that they're unclean. Every person knows that they have this disease that is uh, infecting others if they're around them. They know they've been put out that uh, among all these people, hundreds and thousands of people, hey, don't get around these people because they got lepers. Mr. Dion, how do you think that would be would make you feel knowing that these people are putting out to everyone about you having this 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 uh, disease and you're pronounced unclean and everywhere you go you have to holler out unclean unclean and then you can go around certain areas you still can't go around those people though. Uh, I feel like it'd be like kind of like the walk of shame in a way just knowing that like you know, people are going to be running to get out of your way or like just staring at you the whole time. Some people, you know, like nowadays you do this, you know, like they can't breathe around you or nothing. Some will cover their eyes like they can't look at you and they'll get it. So, yeah, I feel right. like it's a walk shame. Be dreadful. <laughs> uh -huh. I heard you had a little uh, disease one time. So, you know, you can't take chances. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, that's where these masks come from. Because when COVID was exposed and we started knowing about people having COVID, they said, hold it, if you got it, you better make sure you're not around your family members and you're going to have to quarantine for over seven days or five to seven days. Out there during that time, they wouldn't allow you to quarantine because there was no, there was no balm. There was no serum. There was nothing that can heal the people from leprosy. So now, everybody has become an enemy to him. And Elder Brian Bear, what do you think I mean by everybody's almost they coming like an enemy to them? Um, just because they have this condition, you know, uh, they have to look around as if, you know, they're they're just ostracized. Absolutely. And you know that they're, they, they have got to be going through. And so here, when we, this story picks up, they are starving. They can't go into any place. They used to have places that they could go and get some food outside of the city. But here they are. They can't even go in the city. They can't go around the people. And they are starving. And because they're starving, they are saying to themselves, we are about to die. I don't know about you. But I've had times when I've gone on certain fasts, and I've gone on, when I've started going on fast, I remember going on fast like five days, and <laughs> I thought it was the end of the world. I was like, five, I need five days. And then you notice, uh, for any of you who've gone on fast for a little while, you notice when you do start eating, uh, you try to tear everything. A minister, uh, Manuel, I know you used to be a professional uh, person that used to fast. Uh, how does it feel when you finally break your fast? What do you? How do you eat? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. First of all, most of the time I pretended to be fasting, <laughs> but for the times, <laughs> the times that I was actually fortunate enough to be able to make it through, um, I wanted I wanted the biggest burger that I can possibly see, and because uh, unknowingly our stomach shrinks, and so you eat that, and then oh, you're just messed up, uh, but you just want to eat so much, but you. You, you can't eat as much as you used to. Mm -mm, absolutely. And uh, uh -huh, I'm going to talk to you about that. You broke it fast, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> we were involved in a church. 
And in this church, uh, the same one that uh, Emmanuel's talking about, he and I used to go to the same church. And in this church, when you when they would call a fast, that meant the father, the mother, and the kids. Everybody had a fast. And some of those fast three days, you had nothing. And some didn't even have water. Woo! And you could imagine how the throat would be trying to put some uh, food up into it. Good God. So here they had been without food, these lepers, had been without food so long that they were thinking about now, we're going to die. And this is what they said. If we just sit right here, we know for surety we're going to die. But if we go back over to the actual, uh, the people that we come from, the, the Israelites, if we go there, they're going to kill us for actually breaching the law, for breaking the law. So what we have to do, we're going to have to go over to our enemies, the camp of the Syrians. And these Syrians wanted the actual children of Israel dead. That's why they put a siege on them. That's why they wanted to kill them. Sometimes we have to just make a decision. And those decisions we make has got to be more than doing what we've been doing all the time. Most people that I know that have certain needs, they become comfortable in their need. And what I mean by that is comfortable in it is that I've lived with it. I've had this for a while. So, you know, I, I guess it's going to always be that way. But there are certain things you can't get comfortable in, especially if it's life threatening. These four lepers, they said, you know what? We're going to we, listen. Now, notice this. They haven't mentioned anything about God. But let me remind you about there was a conversation that was taking place that same day that they had this idea to go over to Syria or to the Syrians and try to get food. The prophet Elijah has just declared and prophesied it that by this time tomorrow, this actual famine will be gone. Because there was a famine in the land. There was a drought in the land. No rain, no food, and you already knew what they were eating. So the prophet says this, Elijah says that it's by this time tomorrow, imagine if somebody came to you right now and said, you know what? I know you kind of broke. Probably don't have the money that you need, but by this time tomorrow, you'll be rich. Tomorrow. All right. Y'all looking at me like, <laughs> I'm glad this is a Bible story. <laughs> it's a true Bible story. Elder Angel Barrett, you're an elder. Mm -hmm. Suppose, you know, somebody came and said, Elder Angel Barrett, by this time tomorrow, and you already know your financial condition, you will be a millionaire by this time tomorrow. How would that make you, what would you think? My first thought was, is this for real? Are they, is this a real prophet? Uh, I, I would have a hard time believing it. Mm -hmm. Especially because remember this now, they've had the seeds going on. The seeds didn't just last one day. They're starving these people out. And all of a sudden, here comes it. And remember, remember now, this is not a broadcast that everybody got. This is only those people that were in that chamber. And as far as the people that were in that chamber, the only one who's believing what Elijah said is Elijah. The king doesn't believe it. The, the guy that's his head servant, I mean, the a guy who's uh, with him that's another servant, he doesn't believe it either. And then all of a sudden you want me to believe that God is going to change the entire economy tomorrow? And how are they going to bring this money to me anyway? Sister Tanya, how would that make you feel? Somebody tells you tomorrow, you know, and you don't know them from the man on the moon, just heard that they're a prophet. Tomorrow, Tanya, you and Emmanuel are going to be wealthy, rich. Tomorrow. I wouldn't believe it. I would be like, you're crazy. I don't know you. 
Oh. Um, and I, I would also think like, you know, kind of pertaining to, you know, the, the Bible story, like, yeah, okay, everybody's going to be fine by tomorrow because half of us are going to be dead. So we're going to be able <laughs> to get food from, you know, we're going to be fine tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I didn't think of it like that, but yeah, well, I don't know if they're going to all be dead. But anyway, yes, and that's very, you know, if, if we just be for real, because a lot of times, if you say you can believe that God will change the economy in one day, you should never worry about anything in your life. Because in order to change the economy, it's got to change the economy for over two and a half million people in this story. All these millions of people, they were part of the action of the children of Israel. And he's prophesying that by this time tomorrow. So you know what? It doesn't hit the, the, the headlines. It doesn't hit CNN. It doesn't hit MSNBC. It doesn't hit Fox. It doesn't hit your channel 2, channel 5, channel 7, channel 11, channel 4. It doesn't hit none of those news broadcasts. And they definitely are not going to publish it in newspaper or even on a tablet of stone. The only reason that right now, 2,000 and almost 300 and something years later that we're reading about it is because it came to pass. Because if it didn't happen, we wouldn't even be reading about it. So what happens is these four lepers don't know anything about any prophecy. All they know is that they're going over into the Syrians and then have surrounded uh, the actual Samaria and the children of Israel. We're going over there to see if we can get some kind of food from them. What they did not know is that God, child, I'm getting excited just thinking about the rest of this story. God caused the Syrians to hear a noise, a distinct noise that sounded like they were being surrounded by all these other soldiers and that they were getting ready to be destroyed. And so the Sumerians, when they heard this noise, and it sounded like the noise of, of chariots and horses and all these other things, they got scared. And they said, guess what? It's the Egyptians and the Hittites. And they have joined in with the actual children of Israel. And they're about to destroy us. So let's all run. Let's go. Let's go. And thousands and thousands of them, they were in such a rush, they left and left all of their goods, all of their silver, all of their gold, all of their wealth, all of their riches, all of their clothes, all of their food, all of their cattle, all of their oxen. They left everything in a haste. Doggone it, I would say it like this. When God gets ready to move, there is nothing, no devil, no hell or high water that can come against a child of God when our Father, our Heavenly Father, is ready to move on our behalf. The problem with us is that we're so smart, we try to figure it out. And then if we try to figure it out and it happens, then we take the glory. So God, many times, will allow us to be put into a predicament that we cannot figure out and we cannot deliver ourselves. And when we get to that point and we're looking up and we're crying out to God, Lord, we need your help because if you don't move, it won't get moved. That's what God's waiting for. He's waiting to hear us say, Lord, I need, I need a move. I need a reprieve. I need to see your hand. I need to be able, I'm seeking your face, but I need to see your hand move on this situation. God calls the sound that these enemies, and God, as he, he promised to Abraham, I'll be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversary. There is no problem too hard for God, or as we tend to say in this day, light work. That's real talk. So they ran out of the, they ran out of the area of Samaria. So imagine these four lepers come into this actual city, and when they come into the city, thinking they're looking to where's the Samaria? There's got to be these guards at the gate because they surrounded all of Israel. How do you think they're feeling now that they've gone, and now they're actually? are in the Sumerian area, and they look and they see these people left out of here. They left their gold, 
silver, clothing, wealth, riches. Elder Brian Barrett, you're, you're, you're a man of God. How do you think that they were feeling when they saw this? What did they think they probably were involved with? What, what do you think was, was, was going through their mind? Um, it could be a trap. Could be a trap. It's a setup. We're not crazy. All right, let me ask you all here. Most of you all have gone fishing before and have caught things. If you want to catch a fish, you generally get some kind of worm or some type of uh, item that fish like to eat. Uh, if you want to catch a mouse, you get cheese. You know, things that they like to eat. It's a trap. People love riches. And these people have so many thousands of them that they surrounded the children of Israel. And you mean to tell me we four lepers, we ain't crazy. We may be lepers, but we ain't crazy. Are you crazy? No, we ain't crazy. You crazy? I ain't crazy. I'm right in here. Do you see what I see? I see what you see. You see what I see? I see what you see, but I don't believe what you see. Are we dreaming? Smack me. How? Okay, you smack me. But I know I ain't dreaming. Don't, don't hit me no more. Yeah. We're not dreaming. God has the ability to make a dream come true. What do you think prayer is for? Prayer is for a conversation with God who is limitless, with us who are limited. And most of the time, the limited are asking the limit, the limitless to move on our behalf. The Bible says they went and started getting the gold and some of the gold or the silver and the clothing. And they start taking it out of the city, out of the city, start burying it and hiding it. And all of a sudden, this thought comes to all of them. And I'm getting ready to close in a minute. Why don't we tell the children of Israel? Why don't we tell the king of Israel that the Syrians are not here anymore? And allow them to come because we can't keep all this stuff. This entire almost a city of things. But we're going to share it with others. So that's what they did. They went and told, the, they went and got word back and they went back over to where the actual Samaria was being surrounded and is not surrounded anymore. And those four lepers are the one saying, hey, there's no more Syrians here. They're not here anymore. They've left. You can come and spoil their goods. The king said, I don't believe that. Let's send some spies over there and see. It must be a, he must, they must be making this up. They didn't got not only sick, but they see now. The king sends over there men to check out that land. And when he checks out the land, he finds out all the, the Syrians have really left. And the people, when they heard that, have y'all ever been in a, a big department store and they have a big, big sale? What happens, Sister Tanya, when you go into a part, department store, they have a big, big sale and they have a few Items that are like dirt cheap, but they're very expensive. What do people do? Uh, they run through the store and they try to <laughs> trample over each other, push people out of the way, yes. um, trying to get to those, what they want. Absolutely. And that's exactly what happened. When the people in Samaria heard that the Syrians had all gone and left their wealth and riches, you think they sat there and said, well, that was their wealth. From they, what? They took off all of these people, hundreds of them, thousands of them, left the city in a rush to get to the, where the Sumerians were, to be, I mean, the Syrians were, to take all their wealth and riches away. Watch this. And the person that didn't believe what Elisha had prophesied got caught up in the move and the running of the people and were trampled over and killed. And the prophet said, you shall see it, but you won't be able to enjoy it because he knew that same man would be killed. That's as far as I'm going to go with today. And I want you to know on that collateral damage, even though you may have gone through a lot of things and feel like you're stuck in a predicament, God wants you to step out on faith. 
Be like them children of Israel. Don't sit there and just complain about, I don't have money. I don't have, I can't pay my bills. I don't know what this is coming from. I've been sick in my body. I've been, you know what? Go and see. You may find out that God has this way of healing and delivering and making it so that the very people who are the least popular are the ones that save the entire nation. Here's what I'm going to ask you. As I said earlier, watch this. Not ask, but I'm going to say this last thing. Last thing I'm going to say is this. If those four men were not leprous, they never would have been outside the city. If they never were outside the city, they never would have been banned because they had leprosy from going to back to their own home. So they had to go out to the Syria. If they never went into the Syria area, they never would have realized the Syrians were gone. If they never realized the Syrians were gone, they and the children of Israel were starved out and God had already moved. So the leprosy that they had was needed to deliver an entire city and nation. As I said earlier, the very thing that you're dealing with right now, even though it looks like it's something you don't deserve and shouldn't be having to deal with, it's not all about you. It's about people coming after you. But when you get the blessings from God, be sure you remember other people. God never blesses people to only keep it upon yourself. Amen. Without any further ado, we're going to have uh, uh, Elder Brian Barrett, if you don't mind, sir, ending us with a word of prayer. Amen. Lord, we thank you for our lesson today, oh God. We ask, so guys, you're teaching us patience and patience in our trials and tribulations, our jobs concerns, our health concerns. We just ask for your grace. We ask, so guys, the patience to know that you have a time to bring us out. And it's a testimony for your goodness and your grace. We know when you move in a situation, oh God, we have no control over. We can do nothing but give you the honor, glory, and praise. And asking this week, Lord, that you would move as a result of this lesson to confirm your word and our understanding of this, uh, which was taught today by Pastor Scott. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we thank and praise God for each of you coming out today. As I mentioned earlier, appreciate you. And uh, again, I pray that you'll take this word in and go believing, go seeking. You never know that very thing that you think that was so hard and it seemed like you've dealt with and had for so long, God may have given you a reprieve of it and move that thing out of the way. And as God does bless you, be sure that you're sharing your blessing with others and you're sharing about the blesser to them also. Thank you so much, Sister Michaela, for coming out. I really appreciate you. Uh, Sister Shyla, you and Ian, thank you all. Sister Laura Lai. Brother Memphis, uh, everybody, the Barrett, the Scots, the, the Finleys, everybody, thank God for all of you. And for those of you who uh, I sent out actually these copies to, I pray that you get something wonderful out of it. Go back over this lesson. There's a lot in there, uh, in here, and I think it'll be a blessing to you. Take care. God bless. I love each and every one of you all. We'll see you soon now. Bye-bye.